What is up, Watch Fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop. And I'm Anna, I am the content director. And today, we're going to be answering about 10 of your questions, specifically about Omega's new release that I think, while cool, missed the mark incredibly. I want to know who's responsible for it. I'm very interested. Um, I'm Cublo and, and other things The as well. rise and fall of popularity of watch brands. Oh yeah, that's, that's the first question. That's a good one. So, let's get into it. Boom, watch fan. All right, before we get into it, what are you wearing on your wrist today, Anna? Um, today, I'm wearing a Rolex Submariner Reference 1680. That's a hell of a watch. With a beautiful cluster patina. It's in the watch shop. Um, yes, it is. It's really fun to wear. It's really beautiful, and I think that that uh, custard accent is lovely and unique. You've always been a Submariner fan. I Not that I didn't yeah. like it. It's just not something that goes with my you know style usually, yeah. but this watch is so wearable. I mean, yep. Jesus. I it's love really it. beautiful. It's in great condition. I'm wearing the exact opposite of a Rolex Submariner. I'm wearing a Bulgari Piaget, um, kind of tank normal. Now, of course, that's a Cartier term, but this case was certainly inspired by them. Um, ultra thin, manually wound. Do you beautiful. say it has diamonds on the lips? I, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say it's a white dial. I don't know what I would call it. Um, I don't know what I'd call the dial. Uh, and of course, on the lugs, we have uh, some set diamonds. You know what it's like? It's like paper. Yeah, it's like, it's, 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 like it's yeah, Sorry. it's a, it's de definitely. I'll, I'll think of a name for the for the dial. But anyway, this is the newest watch in my personal collection. So it's got me feeling very uh, Ralph Lauren. So yeah, that's a good. Speaker. I love it. Cool. All right, let's get into the first question. Let's do it. So the first question is, um, what watch brands do you expect to rise and fall in popularity in 2020? Uh, let's start off with rise. Uh, okay. I think that the you know the big elephant in the room is Tiffany. Right. Uh, Tiffany & Co. was recently sold uh, to LVMH maybe just a, a month or two ago right. uh, for a little under $20 billion, I think. Uh, yeah, Tiffany has been a brand that has been, uh, while on the fringe, still very important to watches and the history of watches. Yes. Um, Forever, uh, whether it was their you know uh, engagements with Rolex and Patek Philippe, Stamps. whether it was their own watches, which were worn by certain presidents, I, I don't remember which. The, the Tiffany it has a presence in the history of watches. Now they have some watches. The line is too confused, right? But yes. I think that that name, that Tiffany name, is so much richer than the previous management uh, kind of gave it credit for, right? I feel like the, you know, the, the previous management, the Tiffany you know, and Co. watch department. Rested on their laurels, you know, uh, and what they really should have been doing was, I, I don't mean creating incre wild things, what they really should have been doing was creating interesting on-brand designs. Maybe not even that many designs, maybe one showcase of designs, mm. you know, uh, in, of course, different sizes and metals, fine. Uh, and treat it like a job, right? Do it consistently, market it consistently. The only news Tiffany's had as was when they released their, their chronograph or, or their time only that CT 40 or 60 a while ago. It seemed like people worked on it, no, not the watch itself, but the marketing. They worked on it for a month and then no one ever heard of it again. You know, that was it. It, was, it seemed like they brought in private contractors to come in for a quarter and, and, and launch this watch and then that was it. Actually, that may have been what happened. Um, they need to take it seriously. There's obviously so much you know, potential money in it. Tiffany is, is one of the world's most important you know, name brands. I would love to see it happen. I think it will happen. Um, I think LVMH is the company to make it happen. Number two, going independent, uh, Rochep Rochepi. Right, the, the same gentleman who was behind Acrivia, which is such a, which is a more famous, you know, brand in the independent watch space. Um, Rochep Rochepi, who is the watchmaker and the namesake you know, of, of of the watch itself, this Chronomet Contemporain, controlled the entire dialogue or almost the entire dialogue of independent watchmaking in 2019. Um, in the circles and the really in the no circles, right? Um, I was lucky enough to kind of be in those circles and listening. You know, I didn't have so much input. Um, I'd never met Rochep Rochepi. I had, I, I didn't know who the hell Rochep Rochepi was. Um, not that long ago, only a couple months ago, you know, when a friend said, oh, I'm thinking like getting a Rochep Rochepi. I was like, what is that? He goes, oh, a Crivia. And I was like, well, okay, how does that connect? And then all of a sudden, you know, when I dug into it, you know, a foot more, I found, wow, this is becoming a real thing. Of course, still very small. I don't think that that company will scale to be a mass producer of watches, but as far as social importance, um, Rochep Rochepi may be having his day. We, of course, dove more into that, 
in a video which you'll link below, right? Yep. It was the best and worst watches. Best and worst watches of 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big, really cool. Ricardo Macca Temperon, you said, was one of the three best watches of 2019. Yeah. So, which is great. Big things are happening with that brand. Um, and finally, Grand Seiko. This is a layup. Of course, as you guys know, we are partners with Grand Seiko, but the point remains um, this brand is, is taking uh, outreach extremely seriously. Right? We did an entire video about the event that they hosted in Los Angeles, um, close to the Los Angeles boutique on Radio Drive, uh, uh, launching their Godzilla. Mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, in short, Grand Seiko seems to be more willing to, to tell their story than almost anybody else. And when I say more willing, I mean more willing to put resources. Yeah. When I say resources, I don't just mean money, right? Money isn't the fixer of all marketing problems. In fact, money can only, you know, makes marketing worse in, in many instances right. because it just allows you to overinvest in bad ideas. Um, the right. team behind right. Grand Seiko um, is inventive. They really understand the American, uh, maybe globally as well, but they understand the American watch market well. Um, and I think you're going to see enormous things come from them in 2019, 2020, just the same way you saw incredible things, most notably the Four Seasons, yeah. come from from them in 2019. Mm -hmm. Big year for Grand Seiko. So now for brands that might be falling, what do you think about Vermont? Let me first say, when, 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 this whole idea of falling, it can kind of just mean, you know, you're not growing. You know, you could be right. shrinking marginally, you could be staying the same. Ultimately, it's not, not great. Um, and I think that Vermont does fall in that category. Um, they, they, I'm, not, I'm not affiliated with Vermont. I've had almost no contact with the brand, mm -hmm. almost no, um, but it doesn't seem like anything exciting is going on. I feel like much of Vermont's heyday is behind them. Um, you know, they were kind of engaged on a social level with Jimmy Fallon at one point. They were kind of new on, you know, to different boutiques. So it was, oh, this is the new British waft. It's associated with pilots and flying. This is cool. But that wears off, you know. And yeah. again, going back to Tiffany, you know, the launch is, is certainly the first, you know, first most important moment. Mm -hmm. It's not the only important moment. You know, and I think that's the problem with Vermont. I think that they're probably shrinking. I don't think that they're growing. So by default, I suppose they're getting smaller. Um, I would like to see them do well. I think that their prices are a little bit inflated, but it's hard. It's hard out there when you're a new brand and you have no historical story to tell. Yep. Unlike Tiffany, unlike Rolex, um, unlike even a brand that, uh, even people that buy a brand name. Panerai was resurrected from the dead. Mm -hmm. Just they bought the brand. The, the people that ran Panerai in the 90s had no affiliation with the Panerai of the early 20th century. Right. But they bought the name, right? So there's history. And, and to that though, I think Grand Seiko faces a similar issue as what you're saying, but it's but it's potentially even worse. They're trying to be a luxurious counter yeah. to Swiss watchmaking. Yeah. And they, they do have history, but it's yeah. this sort of baggage, you know, in a way. Yeah, people a lot of don't it. consider them necessarily an alternative to Swiss watchmaking because it's like, oh, well, it's Seiko. I don't know. Yeah. And I, that's, I think, where the Four Seasons is so impressive because this is, I think, the first line people can go, oh, I, I see. I see yeah. now. Okay. Absolutely. The Four Seasons was a wild mm -hmm. success. It converted so many people that were on the fringe of Grand Seiko into Grand Seiko. Yeah. That was I think, one of the highlights of the watch world in 20, uh, 2019, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. um, from both watches and business point of view. Absolutely. Um, another one that I think is probably a little shaky right now is Moser. I'm a big fan of Moser. Um, yeah, Moser's fun. You know, I look at, I, without, I don't mean this as a belittling, I, I mean this as, as a compliment. Um, I, I, I look at a lot of Mosers, you know, online, pre-owned Mosers um, in that ten to $13,000 price point. You know, incredible watches. Not perfect, I don't like some of the dials, but incredible and interesting, um, inventive dials like this Fumé dial. Um, the, the, the cases are original, the movements are absolutely stunning in both in architecture and in finishing. Mm -hmm. Great. Right? Great. But I'm looking at them on the, you know, pre-owned kind of like, you know, wash up end of their lives. Right. You know? Um, so it's a great opportunity. But it's not a great opportunity for Moser. That's not a terrific reality for the brand. Right. That's a terrific reality for us as consumers. Um, the brand has done such a great job marketing historically. It, when I say that, I mean, let me refine what I, what I said. Um, they've done a great job garnering attention in the last couple of years. The Swiss Alps watch, the Cheese watch, and then it was the Icons watch. They've had three at least significant marketing efforts that have really built uh, social awareness. That being said, is it great that out of the three well, only huge marketing attempts that a brand's made in their lifetime, is it great that all three have just been jokes? Or does that kind of, not, not to say does it make you a joke, but, but, but does it uh, associate you with just more like, oh, that was funny. 
Right. As it's opposed like, oh, we to, just wow. wait the next big joke from Moser. Right. Like, okay, cool. They did their thing. That was funny. Good job. Yeah, See they've you done next a, year. They've done a great job with that, but I, I would recommend um, that they, you know, they, they put out a really, a really more serious campaign um, to now establish, you know, a, a serious tone around the brand. Because they deserve it. It's a, it's a wonderful manufacturer. Yeah. You know, but um, anyway, that's my opinion. Okay, transitioning to question number two. Uh, why are platinum watches more expensive than gold watches? Um, platinum is more expensive than gold. Is my answer to that. <laughs> is there another answer? Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Um, but here's a question for you, okay. clarifying. Um, the delta, right? The difference between the price of a, of a particular model, let's say 5711 model, so let's say a Samara, mm -hmm. in, in uh, uh, steel, Okay. To gold, that uh, that that difference is uh, I don't know. Let's say thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Do you think that that thirty thousand dollars represents the difference in value of the material itself? Um, no. So why? Why is it, that's a great question? What else? Like, <laughs> so if, if I'm paying thirty more thousand dollars because this is in gold, mm -hmm. so how much is the gold worth? That's the just a natural question. Right. Why is the Rolex Submariner in yellow mm -hmm. that much more expensive than it in steel? You know, shouldn't the the delta basically equal the value in gold? Yeah, if that's you know, the let's say for plus it. a couple extra dollars because there's a premium. But really, there's significant premiums on top of the gold weight uh, in in the watch. How significant? Like how significant? Do you know? I don't. I don't. Anyone out there? Yeah. Do you know the answer to this question? I mean, I don't know specifically. I know I've, I, I know I've right, looked into it before. Exactly how much yeah, I don't know. Going. I mean, you know. But I, that is a really interesting question. Jeez, eyeballing it, you know, being someone that, that has bought and, you know, bought and sold gold. Okay. I would say that a Rolex Submariner in gold weight is, you know, just, just the gold worth no more than, than $10,000, $13,000. That might even be high. Okay. You know, that might even be high. And and yet the premium is 20 and change. Mm, yeah, that seems odd. So anyway, question. bottom line is, obviously we're both kind of ignorant on this question. It's a great question. If anyone out there has a more specific answer, please let us know. Okay, so third question. Let's talk about the new Speedmaster, the Ed White. Mm. Uh, do you think that the price is justified? And first explain like what it is and then is the price justified? Yeah, good question. So bottom line, uh, Omega just released this new Ed White, uh, not a limited edition, a regular production model into their uh, into their line. Um, it, it's a Speedmaster modeled after the vintage Ed White, which was a straight lugged non-professional Speedmaster that Ed White, the astronaut, did in fact where they just re-released it at fourteen thousand one hundred dollars. I think Omega is making a big mistake. I think that Omega has read the market, read their brand positioning, read the okay what tactics are working where, i.e. Rolex. Okay. And I think that they missed out on a major prohibitive factor here, being all Speedmasters kind of look the same. At least to right. most people. Mm -hmm. So let's go into the release now. So Omega just released this Ed White. It, it is under 40 millimeters, which is really attractive. That's the nice. bracelet is that brick bracelet, which I find more attractive than the uh, Speedmaster Pro bracelet. Mm -hmm. um, the movement is Omega's 321 caliber, which has basically remained unchanged since its original uh, inception, which, you know, mind you, the 321 was featured both in the original Speedmasters in 57 and in 1969 when we went to the moon. Right, so that's that's twelve so that's twelve okay. years, right, mm -hmm. um, of of run and significant achievement, uh, and that and that movement is in this you know new watch. Mm -hmm. My problem is, you know, explain to me, Omega, how how this is double the price, more than double the price of the professional. You know, the Speedmaster right. Professional is sixty three hundred and fifty dollars retail. You can get them in the mid fives, right, um, and that's brand new. We're talking about pre owned, they're dropping into the fours and, and wow. low fours, right. So, so my problem is comparing retail to retail, apples to apples. Where is the difference? W what makes it the difference? Objectively, the 321 is an older movement than what's utilized in, in the in the Speedmaster Pro, Monster Pro. The bezel is ceramic as opposed to aluminum, but that, apart from that and design changes, the two watches seem to be akin. You know, so so. What is the difference here? And I would, I'm gonna just interject and I say, I would, I can see crazy premiums as we always do on limited watches. Like if it's a limited run. Yeah, but not from retail, but not no. from retail. Well, and that you, usually comes in from aftermarket. You know, you don't see that's, it. Yes, that's, uh, that's true. But this is all, I, I just find it strange that this is, it's not, there's, I mean, there is obviously something special about it, but it's not 
I don't see where yeah. the desire is yeah. to want to get it so bad to yeah. pay that premium. And, and you know, obviously, well, it seems to us like what, what Omega is trying to do, they're trying to replicate the frenzy around the Daytona. Right, uh, they're trying to create this, you know, sporty, obviously chronograph, forty millimeters, basically. Um, this one yeah. is manual as opposed to automatic, which I do think limits the the overall likability mm -hmm. to the mass market. Yeah, for um, sure. and they're trying uh, again. This is total speculation. Um, they're trying to create a, a, a market that is, you know, hyped up. That these watches are trading at sixteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars. And while it certainly does something for Omega's bottom line, it does more for their brand reputation. It does more to make Omega an aspirational brand. But yeah. the reality is that Rolex only makes one Daytona, you know, or two Daytonas, black and white. But you know, it's a thirteen thousand yeah. dollar watch. They trade in between fifteen and or between eighteen and twenty five on the aftermarket. Mm -hmm. And um, if you own one, that means that you either paid. A huge premium yeah. or even paid retail and it's exclusive whereas uh whereas omega <laughs> there are 57 models there are so big, many speedmasters and the people that are driving up the the you know daytona craze are not just watch geeks these are mm -hmm. regular people yeah. as well you know i have you know cousins that don't care about watches at all know nothing about watches okay cool get me a daytona You're right because it's the watch to have right? yeah um so no, those people, the mass market, I don't think that they'll care enough to say, oh no, no, well this is the, this is the 321 movement. Oh, and it's a straight log, it's not twisted. Oh, and it doesn't see the professional on the dial. <laughs> right. It's a Speedmaster, right? No one's gonna see the difference. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, this is more of a criticism from you know the, the, the marketing end than it is from than anything else. Um, it's, still, it's still a cool watch, but I don't think Omega, if that's Omega's intention, I do not think that they will be successful. I don't think yeah. that, the, that the Speedmaster will be the next Daytona in the sense of this frenzy. Mm -hmm. um, that's it, period. Next question. Great, next question. I'm looking for a new strap on my day date with a black dial. Help me out. What do you think? So black dial, day date, no bracelet, the case? leather strap, yellow gold. It's yellow, ooh! Um, I, would, I think blue. Uh, but I, I don't know if our blue, Sark... Black and blue? I mean, well, black well and blue but go. the gold and blue go beautifully. Yeah. And, but, so that's one option, but I think that most blues are a little too dark, and then if it's light, it kind of makes it a different yeah. watch. But I would say the Jurassic. Oh, uh, the which Korean. Is Theo and Harris Jammer, so yeah. custom strap on theoandharris.com. It's linked up there and down there. Yeah. Um, because that, that green totally complements the yellow, yes. and I just think it, it keeps yeah. the, it's a little formal, but it keeps like a Run yeah. To the black. Absolutely. Someone just uh, threw a Jurassic on a uh, on a complicated JLC reverso and it was stunning. Oh, that's awesome. um, I've used the Jurassic on Rolex Explorer 5504. Stunning. Yeah. It's very rugged while being dressy. It rides yeah. around really well. It the does. Jurassic's very recommendation. It's very swampy, but in like a chic way. <laughs> yes. Swamp, swamp, swamp chic. Uh, so if you're interested in purchasing whether it's a Jurassic strap or any one of our other straps, um, be it the Type 1, the Quint, uh, the Mare, uh, the go Rover. ahead, the Rover, go ahead and click the link in the description down below. Yeah. Next question, um, should I wait for a Cartier drive update or just pull the trigger now? You go. Um, well, if there's a reason you're not buying the Cartier drive, like if, there, if you wanna see something specific yep. and you're kind of like, you only really wanna buy it if that happens, yep. I would say don't buy it. Don't compromise. Yeah, don't yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it's an expensive watch. Like if if there's something similar you can, if that you want that thing and, yeah. and the drive is almost that, yeah. then get something else or just wait, I just, you know. Don't settle for waiting, too many options. Waiting for a major, major, major company to release exactly what you want is very difficult. Also, you know, like it's, your it's watch, but slightly errand. different. It's a fool's errand, yeah. I think. Um, it's possible. It's possible. Um, and that be and that's then and that doesn't mean I'm telling you to settle with the one with the other one. Mm -hmm. um, if you genuinely like the other one, if you can think that you will love it, and it's worth your money, then buy it. Even if it's not perfect. No, no, you know, no watches are perfect. There's always you know I have watches I look at and I say, wow, that would have been a little bit better if let's say the date window was more exaggerated mm -hmm. in, in the in the kind well, of like, you also have mostly vintage, so yes, but still the point remains. Um, Nothing's perfect, basically, you know. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't mean that it's it's not worth owning. So mm -hmm. do a little, you know, analysis there. Some, some well, evaluation. That answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, next question. What time is it? Now check your phone. I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't say much. One thirty-one. No, not, it's my phone. My, my watch is on. My watch is on uh, on time. That's great. This is not. I didn't. When I, I say that, I, I mean didn't set this. I usually don't set it. Yeah, my watches are never on it time. It is two ten. I, I never Here. set them. This thing is pretty sick though, isn't it? And it's the fourth. <laughs> it's glamour. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, what is the manliest watch you like? 
Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I like, well, I like subs, but um, Roy I, Royal Oak probably. Mm. However, yeah. as we all know, the Royal Oak that I want, I don't think is like manly. But I think yeah. the Royal Oak in general is. Well, it's, it's very industrial. It's very hard edge. Yes. You know, but... whereas feminine is usually looked at as softer, like a Cartier, you know, yeah. uh, the, the Alonge, things like that. It's usually typically feminine. But Well, I think now that it's a little blurred, especially with the Royal Oak, because it's so thin. And now, like, thicker, bulkier. Yeah, but they're, not, they're, 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 they're not asking for, you know, the, the guy wasn't asking for a, you know, an in depth analysis. <laughs> a thesis of, on of, it. Right, well, well, I'm just trying to answer the best of my ability. Right. Okay. I mean, I think but I think the Royal Oak for me. Generally, the Royal Oak is viewed as a masculine model. Yeah. Of course. It's Especially the bigger models. Like. You know, I think a, a woman in a Royal Oak is a, is a beautiful thing because it's, it's cool. oxymoronic in a way. It's industrial. Yes. It's hard edge. It's super cool. How about um, you? For me, uh, the most masculine watch that I like. Yeah. Um, I go back to that Especially zenith. Hard. I like that that ceramic zenith. I think is amazing. The Defy. Um, that again, it's kind of like yeah. hype beastie. It's a little Hugh Blowish. You know, it's certainly yeah. a child of that. If you kind compare of it to Hugh Blow, then it era. really makes it more. Yeah, I think it's probably the most masculine watch I like. I don't really like Daytona. Uh, Daytona's masculine. Daytona's masculine. Daytona's masculine. Daytona's yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that you know, I think that probably the Defy is a little bit more yeah. modern yeah. masculine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas the Daytona is a little bit more classical masculine. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah, you're but right. anyway, you're talking to a guy wearing a watch that's like three millimeters thick and has diamonds in the bezels. So you're talking about so, yes. <laughs> um, um Next question: What is the best strap for a Rolex Datejust reference 1601, which means white gold bezel, um, with a blue dial? I want to say you're going on the warmer side to bring out the blue. So that's our reds, or oranges, or yellows. And I personally love the 740. I love the alligator, and I think that the color is really soft, but it's also almost an exact complement to the blue, so it will yeah. really bring it out, so that's my answer. Well, I'm biased. I, I have a 1601 in blue, and I wear it with a Type 1 strap because it's the most beautiful combination, that's and that is and little, it's wrong. It's a so. little it's a little more, like, rugged. I, I don't want to say manly because I don't Yeah, wear, no, it is more, it's more it sporty. Is, it's, yeah. it's more sporty, certainly. Yeah. The 740 would be a more dressy combination. Little, yeah, exactly. We're try it together. I, 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 we should. totally try it, yeah. Okay, next question. Oh, or the flat iron. If you're going like flatter, like a little, a little more baseline yeah. neutral. Yeah. Yeah. Again, all of these straps are available in the Theo and Harris watch shop. They are handmade in France, and we pick out the colors and the combos, and they're all super fun. Mm -hmm. um, next, all of my friends hate the tank, but I love it. What should I do? Buy the tank. Yeah. They're not wearing it. Then you know what? They'll never borrow it. Yeah. Which is just a great <laughs> Which is one of the problems have that I have constantly. Right? We? I borrow your watches? You could borrow my Polaroid oh, if you okay. wanted. Well, I do love your Polaroid. Um, but yeah, I mean, so what? Who cares? Uh, it makes you, it, it, it separates yeah, you. Yeah, it's not about that. You know. It's not about what your friend, then tell your friends I love, you have better taste. Yeah, yeah I friends. feel like it, it's fun to do things that people don't do because it usually means that you're becoming more comfortable with yourself. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's just uh, you. Yeah, it's, it's just you, you know? I wasn't born, like, put it this way. You used to wear you that know, big swatch. Yeah, when I, when I was in middle school, School, you know, I wanted, uh, not that I love, but I, I felt like I should wear you know, super big watches. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I should wear certain clothes, certain shoes that I never really felt comfortable in. And then, and then as you get older, you, one, become more comfortable in, in, your, in yourself, and two, begin to experiment with other things like little Cartiers, which end up bringing me down a rabbit hole to something like this. Um, you become so much happier because you feel like yourself. You yeah. feel separated, you know, individualized. Exactly. Um, it's an amazing feeling. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, next. Is buying an all gold date date without a bracelet a crime? No, that's insane. All gold date dates, 1803s, 1803s, blah, 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 blah. Look incredible on straps. Oh, come on. Are I'm not going to say insane? it's a crime. I think you are missing out. I think. Oh, please. It, it, what do you know? That's horrible. I, oh, I do. I think, I mean, <laughs> do it. Absolutely. But like, should you be nervous? Should you be, oh, are people going to, no, of course oh, you no. can wear the strap. There are so many straps, specifically John Marceau Theo and Harris straps yeah. that look incredible on dating. No, I wouldn't worry about However, what people think about you. It is a, it, sorry, I interrupted you. No, I interrupted you. But it, it is, it feels so good yeah. and it looks so good. It's made for that watch. I have yeah. a personal obsession with the pair together. Yeah. And I just think you don't really get it until you're wearing it. That being said, you may not be a bracelet. No, person. that I agree with. You know, yeah. you know, if you have an H and if you have a day date on a strap, you you have not experienced the feeling of wearing an all gold roll. Mm -hmm. It's not the Which same is, thing. Whoo. It is probably classier, it is more tasteful, it is more conservative, it is more gentlemanly, mm. um, but it is not that flash, you know, 
Uh, it's just not. You know, it's it, 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 it's just not. I did it. I've done both. I love them both ways. Um, my dad wears his 1601 Datejust in yellow gold on a bracelet. I happen to love it. I wear it all the time. Um, it, it's a matter of preference, of course. Um, but no, it's not the same thing. But of course, buy it. If it's a matter of money, buy it now. Buy the bracelet later. Completely. Don't don't wait to save for the bracelet. Buy the yeah, watch now. Totally, totally. That's it. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of this Ask TNH Live. It's a blast. I love doing this, Anna. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell them to... If you liked this video, please <laughs> like it right there. And if you love watches, please subscribe yeah. to this channel. We post several times a week, and um, we'll see you guys subscribe. soon. Is buying an all gold day date with a bracelet a crime? Um, no, not at with all. A bracelet? Why Without, would that be a crime? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Twenty six thousand. Damn. Twenty six thousand dollars. If I won the lottery, yo somebody, yo won. somebody won. That's right. Scratch. Come up with a new, inventive, beautiful design. Um, the Kelly is a cool watch, no doubt. I actually quite like it. Uh, I would recommend one. Um, but do I look at it as an achievement of Cartier's design house? No. The Drive was a good watch. That being said, it still doesn't punch me in the stomach the way that the 